we've been uh, a new series started uh, last week called the handiwork of God and uh, this week we're going to be talking about how God could take our mess and like me and turn it into a masterpiece it's interesting to look at our world and our lives and how they are the video is great a bunch of scribbles and how somebody who already saw through all of our scribbles knew that we were intended to be something great and, and, and made to be great. And along our journey, we kind of screw up, but we come back and, and he molds us into the masterpiece that he wanted us to be. How many of you uh, are NBA fans? <laughs> Anybody like basketball? Maybe not. Uh, I, from Sacramento, so I'm a Kings fan. I know there's some people not as blessed in the back, <laughs> like uh, other places, but unfortunately for us, if you could describe the Kings in one word over the last 12 years, what would it be? It would be a mess. It would be, be a complete mess. However, uh, I was blessed and lucky enough to get to go to the game last night, and through all of the mess of our team, and through all of the chaos and all of the disorder, they turned out to make one final game in an arena that was really special into a masterpiece. Uh, if you didn't get to watch it, it was really cool. We got to relive glory days, right? The team that was put together to function well. They had a system, they had a plan, they had a vision, they had leadership, they had teamwork, they had people who knew their roles. They had everything that was put together to function well, and the moment that that functionality started to break down was from the top to the bottom. Leadership started to fall apart, people started to have their own ideas, wanted things for themselves, and it started to get to what it is currently today, which is a hot mess, pretty much like ourselves. God intended us to be something, and, and we start to, to find that, right? Through our mess, we start to figure out God's calling and plans. We, then we get on board, we get excited. We start to see the vision that God has in our life. And you know what? Oftentimes, many of us, we fall back into our scribbles. We fall back into our dysfunction. We fall back into the chaos. And we fall back into our own selfish stuff. And we start to make a mess out of the masterpiece we were created for. God calls us for so much more. And to do so much more. And there's this great example that in all of our mess, all of it, that he could still do the greatest thing. So I looked in scripture to find the person who I thought was the greatest mess on, like, that scripture gives us. And you might have your thoughts, right? You might think, well, Paul kind of was a little bit of a mess before he found God. The disciples were kind of a mess before they found God. There was one guy who was just uh, a crazy mess. But before we do that, let's read our scripture reading. And this is our memory verse for the, the time. I don't know if you've noticed we've done this for our, our scripture reading. I didn't, I didn't scratch the list. Let's see. It's okay. So let's read this together. And I think we only can really truly start to remember scripture when we say it out loud, when we say it often, and when we put it into practice and put it to heart. So if you would indulge me, please, let's read this scripture together. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ready? Here we go. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things He planned for us long ago. He has planned us to do some great things. That was we were we were intended for that. When He looked at you before your parents even thought of you, before you were even uh, they were even thought of, God had plans for you. And he had plans for you to do things that were great, things that were like him. That's why when they got together, they said, let's create them in our image. There was a plan there. However, we like our image better. We like the image of the world better. We get caught up in some things. So what, let's do this. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be in the first five. Well, we're going to be going down this chapter. This guy in scripture may have been the greatest mess ever in the Bible. Do you remember this guy? This was the guy when Jesus and his disciples get to both go to the other side. They, they find themselves in uh, uh, Jerusalem, and it's the guy who was demon-possessed, naked, 
chain, cutting himself, freaking out. Nobody could contain him. He was a wild animal. They, he was living in tombs. I don't know how much more of a mess you could get than living in graveyards, naked, probably swearing at people with grouch. So this is what it says in verse 2. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs to meet him. This man lived in burial caves, and he could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. Okay, everybody, for a moment, look around you. Say, I'm thankful you're not that big of a mess. <laughs> None of us here, I think, I don't want to assume too much, but I don't think any of us here are that guy. We're not crazy Uncle Harry living in the hills who just keeps himself in disorder all day long. Now, we want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say it's not truly his fault. He is demon-possessed, of course, so it couldn't be his fault. Which may be true, uh, but usually those who have evil inside of them at some point allowed evil inside of them. Which is where our, our mess kind of begins. Our mess comes from sin. And we, can, we can blame it on whatever we want. We grew up in a rough area. We only had one parent. Uh, I was in the system. Uh, people are always against me. We can use whatever excuses we want to allow us to think that the sin that is in our lives was not our fault. And when we do that, it gives us the opportunity to say, my mess is not my fault. And that way, we don't feel bad by maintaining our mess. What we do is like every one of your children who you told to clean up the room and you go in later and it looks clean and you open the closet and you almost die by everything that falls out. Or you're like, wow, your bed looks a little higher than normal. And you look under and everything was piled under the bed or shoved somewhere. And they didn't take care of the mess. What they did is they allowed themselves to be able to live in it. We allow ourselves all the time to live in our mess because we don't want to allow ourselves to think, wow, I have allowed a giant disaster inside of me. And what happens is, as we're going to find out soon, it's not just one thing, it's a lot of things. So if we keep reading it in Mark uh, 1 or 5, chapter 5, verse 6, when Jesus was still at some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him, and with a shriek he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I just think that's how he sounds. <laughs> or he sounds a little crazy. I don't know. In the name of God, I beg you, do not torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. The evil spirit begged him again and again to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into the pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. Think about this. This man, I don't think, spent his whole life living in tombs. I don't think he was born in a graveside. I don't think they said this wild animal needs to live way up here. I just don't think that happened. We find out later, it probably didn't because Jesus tells him that we're going to find out to, you can't come with me. I need you to go back and tell your family of all the things that have happened to you. So we have to understand that this man probably had a family. He may have had children. Brother, sisters, wife. At some point in his life, something happened. And it wasn't addressed. Even the people of the town, they didn't help him address it. You know what they try to do? That dude's nuts. Let's put him as far away from us as possible. He keeps coming down this hill. How can we keep him up there? Let's build gates. Let's chain him up. Let's disassociate ourselves with him. Let's do everything in our power to do to get ourselves from him. And nothing was really working because nothing could subdue all of these things inside of him. I want you to understand there is nothing that you can chain down your sinful mess with. 
Right. You can look around the people next to you. There is nobody strong enough to subdue you in your own stuff. There just isn't. You can ask. People can try to help you. If you don't want it, it's not going to work. People can say, hey, I need you to, you might need to get some help somewhere. Yeah, can I pray for you? Can I? All of these things. I'm sure they exhausted every opportunity that they had to help with all of this mess. There is nothing that helped this man until a guy got off a boat by the name of Jesus, walked up, and guess who ran to him? Guess who knew this guy by name? Your mess is afraid of the Savior who's there to clean it up. Jeff Walling used to say this line, and it was really cheesy, and Jeff is good at making cheesy sound good. I don't know who else could do it better than Jeff Walling if you've never heard him talk. He said, the reason that we need a Messiah is because we are such a mess. That's why we need a mess Messiah. <laughs> There's nobody better to sweep up your mess than a Savior who is willing to nail them all to a cross. We have, you know, if you look at this, you're like, well, that is a, how does that work for me? I'm not cutting myself running around. Maybe you are. Do you know that the biggest uh, concern among <laughs> teens that are depressed is cutting? It's a way to make themselves feel better, releases some things inside of them that gives them <laughs> this adrenaline or this endorphins start to go. And, and they do this in their depression or in their anxiety. And it's, a, it's an epidemic. It's something that needs to be looked at. But it's not just teenagers. Adults do this too. Um, it's to cry out a little bit for help, but also it's a way that their their issues have gotten to a point where it's even hurting them physically now too, not just emotionally. It, even bigger than that, um, we may not be up on a hill in our own tombs, but we are dug our own graves of things that we have a hard time to get out of, and our pride gets in the way. Um, our, our just mental health in general gets in the way because we've allowed ourselves so low that nothing can pull us out and we sit up on this hill and I know <coughs> desperately waiting for some help and the people who are coming you think to help you are trying to chain you up so they don't have to deal with you and that is a tough tough place to be and it didn't start that way maybe initially it was like yeah I'll sit and listen to you and I, I want this but eventually all they felt that they can do is to keep distance that is a sad and tough place to be. But things start to change, and in the midst of all of our sin, and all of this struggle, we start to see the Master create. We start to see Him do some things that nobody else was able to do. This wasn't the first time. You know, a man brought his daughter to the disciples to get healed, and they couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. And, and this dad comes up to Jesus and says, If you're willing, I know that you, if, you are, if you are able, if you can... You can heal my daughter. And he's like, if I can, do you know who I am? And he, and he heals her and the disciples say, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we? Well, you didn't have the faith to do it. You're still trying to figure these things out. Even in their best interest, they couldn't help somebody. Sometimes the only cure for your brokenness and your disaster of what we call a life is Jesus Christ. There is something about accepting a Savior who was God, who decided that I can leave heaven because I want to start to mold this creation that I had such great plans for into what I know they could be. And they can't see that unless I come down. They can't see that unless I take on their form. And I will take on a form that has nothing that brings anything to it. No beauty, no majesty, just a humble servant. In his humility, serving his father, saying that I will do this. I will take on death. I will take on a cross. I will show them the power that they could have if they allow the Spirit of God to work within them. The only thing that can take them from where they are to where they need to be. If we look and we go to this next part where we can start to see Jesus creating, we're going to skip down to verse 14. You should read this whole thing. It's one of the best stories of Jesus working with somebody. When you think about like showing the compassion of Christ, it doesn't get bigger than going and, and helping somebody who nobody wants to be around, who everybody's terrified of, who everybody has to put up their defenses literally to figure out how to deal with them. They might throw food at him so he can eat. Who knows? I don't know. 
but we know that they don't want to be around him. So we start to see Jesus work here. So what had happened in between this is Jesus had put the evil spirits into the pigs. And we know the story, right? All the pigs, where do they go? Didn't Jesus have the best sense of humor? Even with the evil spirits, they're like, don't torture us, just put us in these pigs, leave us be, I promise we'll be okay, we'll make good bacon, or whatever it is. And what does he do? He says, oh yeah, sure, I'll do it, that's fine, perfect. He puts them in the pigs, and the pigs go right into the water, and drown, and you have these shepherds who are up there, the ones who took, not shepherds, piggers, <laughs> I don't know, the ones who took care, herdsmen is what it says, the ones who took care of the pigs, looked at it, and you know what happened? They were terrified. Because who is this man? Do you think about this? They've done everything to the point of chaining a man up and hoping that he can just maybe kill himself so they don't have to deal with it anymore or whatever. And this man took everything out of him. He's starting to create a masterpiece that is going to be incredible. Think about the testimony of this guy and we'll get there in a second. Here's what happens. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. You have to imagine this, right? The crazy guy up on the hill is now hanging out with everybody. I want to see what's going on. What? What? There's no way. What happens? The crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw a man who had been possessed by a legion of demons. Here's the cool part. Think about this. Do you understand the transformation that's happened? This had to be the greatest thing they've ever seen. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. Right. And they were all afraid. <laughs> they couldn't imagine that this would ever be. And I want us to really, I mean, I've said this a couple times, you have to think about this. Imagine a family member, one that you love dearly, uh, and all of a sudden something snaps inside of them and they start to, to lose it. How much of your energy are you going to exhaust into helping that person. You're going to do everything, and you're going to start in the most mild way. Oh, let's go to the doctor. Let's go get counseling. Let's do whatever we can. Right, let me hug you more. I don't know what it is. I just want you to get better. And we exhaust every possible thing that we have in us. We may go broke even, because we want this person to just get, we just want you to get better. So you do everything. You've exhausted all you have. Then you go into the village mode mindset. I need more people. I ran out of battery. I need more people to help me put batteries. Thank you. See, I'm prepared this time. <laughs> Could you imagine all the things that you're going to do? And it doesn't have to be a mental health thing. It could just be a physical thing. You're going to exhaust everything that you have to make sure that that person is better. And once it's not happening, there gets to be a point that you start to lose hope. And instead of wanting them to get better, what do you do? You say, I just want them to exit peacefully. Or I want them to, I don't even know, I want to just not have to deal with the stress anymore. Even in your love for them, you try to find something. Nothing works. This whole village, not only because they wanted them to get better, but he was terrifying everybody. Have you ever heard, have you ever been out in the country ever and just heard like, Wolves at work. Anybody ever? So this may sound weird. Well, I was at Pepperdine, not so country, but it's kind of country-esque. I lived in Calabasas off campus, and I lived in this little apartment uh, called the MCAs. Mm -hmm. Caroline had lived there, too. She knows what I'm talking about. But they have these running trails that are out in the back, and it's, it's really cool, but I would never go there at night just because it's, it's scary. But my apartment faced the hillside. <laughs> And at night, you can hear wolves or coyotes, whatever they were, eating something, making sounds that were awful. Howling, screeching sounds of death and murder. I don't know what it was. I wasn't going out of my apartment at, at any time it was nighttime. I was terrified. And I just could imagine there's a guy standing above your town, screeching, howling, yelling, doing something else, whatever he's using to eat, I don't know, but it probably was terrifying. You could imagine that they wanted this guy either out or helped. So I assume they exhausted every ability they had to get this guy the help that he needed. And it didn't work. And they had given up. 
Jesus comes in, and he took the crazy guy, and the next thing you know, he's sitting there, no longer naked, no longer babbling, no longer howling, no longer screeching, no longer being aggressive, yelling, hurting. He was perfectly sane. We lose sight because sometimes I think we view Scripture as uh, good words to live by, maybe um, some fairy tales that just teach us or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I think we lose sight of how incredible the power of the name of Jesus is. When Jesus gets off the boat, these spirits run at him. These are evil people. And they bow down at his feet and they say, what do they call him? Son of the Most High God. Even these evil spirits bowed before Jesus. They recognize his majesty. They recognize who he was. We don't even recognize who he is in our lives all the time. We just view him as the good guy, the one that helps us out, the one that we pray to that fixes our problems, which is what we hope for. But do we bow down before him and say, Son of the Most High God? People were casting out demons in his name that didn't even follow him. How powerful is his name? Because the disciples were worried about those guys, right? There's some guys down by the river casting out demons in your name, but they're not one of us. Well, if they're doing it in my name, then why are you worried about it? The power of Jesus' name is incredible. So here he comes down the hill, perfectly sane, perfectly clothed. And you know what that did to everybody? Freaked them out. They actually want Jesus to go, go somewhere else. Get out of here. Scare us with this stuff. So Jesus starts to leave. And the masterpiece is almost complete. I can't say it's all, it's all complete yet because we, we won't be fully into that masterpiece that he has for us until he calls us home. But, but think about it. Let's look at this. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, No. Go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord had done for you and how merciful he was and he has been. So the man started off to visit ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Jesus took the greatest heap of a mess that I could find in all of Scripture, one that allowed sin to multiply into a legion of evil inside of him. I don't know if he allowed. Sin took over. I can't say he allowed it. But it didn't go away. Living in despair, in anger, in desperation, Jesus fixes him, and you, like anybody here, would say, can I go with you? I know what you do. I would like to be in your presence. I would like to be with you because I'm afraid that if I relapse, I need you to help bail me out. I need you to fix me again. That's what I would think, because that's how I, I am. Somebody helps me, and they're really important to me. I don't want them to go away. <laughs> I want them to stay so that I can keep going back to them. But he says, no, you have to give this same thing that I just gave you to your family. You are now an art piece that needs to be shared, and people need to see it and hear it and look at it. You went from something that everybody wanted to avoid to now something that would hang in any amazing museum that people can all go by and look at or any stage that can produce this beautiful music of a life because you know Jesus now. Do you know that each of us here, if I ask you to raise your hand, just, just humor me, how many of you feel like you know Jesus in your life? I would hope for more hands. So we have, we have some stuff to do. <laughs> we have some things to do, which is good. You don't know how much of a masterpiece you are. The ones who have raised their hands, guess what? You need to be going around and telling people this amazing story about how Jesus cleared up your mess and is continually sweeping it up and wants to put you on the fridge so he can show his dad how awesome this art piece is. 
You may think that you are completely a disaster and that you have no business telling anybody about who God is, but guess what? That disaster is getting better and better every day when you allow Jesus to take control. <laughs> every part of it. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about this morning of uh, how we grow up, how things kind of change us and how we start this new path and a new journey and how we want it and how easily it is for us to fall back to our old ways. And, and Christ calls us to be set apart and to be different. There is a way that this gets, I don't want to say easier because it doesn't, it doesn't, nothing, there's nothing easy about following Christ. There's, it just isn't. But what, what happens is it gets better because you start to now reflect him. Do you know that you as a masterpiece, what you really are? Does anybody know? You're not this beautiful painting. You're not this great. You, all you are is a mirror. You're this big mirror. And our goal is we hang you up and you just reflect the image of who Christ is. And you get to be this beautiful imagery of Christ. And everybody who looks at you or everybody you talk to, you know what they see? They see Christ. And some people are going to be freaked out. And they're going to tell you, go away. And you know what you say? God bless you. <laughs> Shake your dust off. And some people are going to sit there and say, you're not, I knew you before. Didn't you live up in that graveyard? Weren't you the guy cutting yourself? You look different with clothes on. I don't know. But that's the hope. And that's the promise. That no matter where you're at, you can even, even if you still think you can, you're a mess, the master is not done crafting you. And you need a master to make a masterpiece. So I want to leave with a challenge uh, if you already haven't felt the challenge there. The biggest number one cause of knowing that you're a hot mess is how many excuses you use in your life of why you can't be a masterpiece. So I need you to look inward of all the excuses of why you couldn't do more with your life, with your family, with your job, with proclaiming the name of Christ first. Think of those excuses. That is the mess that God wants to help clean up. And we all have it. It's all there. You may think you're doing great because you've cleaned up enough of your life, but you don't want to allow God to clean up the rest. So you start to do this comparison thing, which most of this town's people probably did. I may be bad, but I'm not like Uncle Charlie up on the hill screaming around. If you're holding on to, to some bitterness or some anger or some depression or, or whatever, if you're, if you're holding on to things because it makes you feel like who you are, like I, I want to pray with you to let that go. I hope that when you look inside yourself, you start to see the beauty that God had made you to be. You weren't made by accident. You weren't, you weren't made you know, by coincidence. Even if you have parents that didn't want you, you weren't made to be an accident. You were made to do good things that God has planned for you to do long ago. Not just to do them, but you were made a masterpiece to be God's handiwork. God is entrusting you His business. Like the sign on heaven says, gods and sons and daughters. A family business since eternity. <laughs> you have this family tie that nobody else has. You have a network of, that's calling you home that nobody else has. Actually, we all have it. It's just who's willing to listen to it and move towards it. Let's pray. Then, Father, Lord, we are so grateful that you can actually see beauty in the beast that we are. That through our scribbles and through our childlike looking lives of whatever it is that we're putting out there for you, you look at it and you see Picasso, Monet, Da Vinci, Michelangelo. You see this great masterpiece in the making. And God, I pray that 
that we don't have to look for our potential, but we look for you. Because as we look for you, we don't even just reach our potential, we surpass it to become greater than we could ever imagine we could be because our perspective of life changes and aligns with yours. That we can see through the mess, we can reach so many people because maybe they are sharing in the same mess we are. And together, through your love, your power, your Holy Spirit, we can clean up these things together. Create a life that is calling others to you by sharing the story of how you cleaned us up. How we were sitting there in a completely different than how we got to you. And when we came to you in our sin and in our struggle, Satan holding on to our hearts, we bowed before you and said, help. And you took them away. And you told us to get up and to share this great compassion with our families, with the people that we live amongst. And God, I just pray that we can have that joy and that excitement and that urgency to let people know that where we are at is not the end, but it's the beginning to a path that lasts forever. Yeah. One that is called by you, sanctified to be holy and righteous, set apart, that only we can have by your son who came and gave us that gift. We thank you for that gift. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.